Okay, so what I'm going to do in this message, or what I'm going to do in this series is review my book, The Eternal Blueprint. And I had originally set out to do an audio book, but I realized uh, I would put you to sleep if I did that. So I'm going to do it more as a teaching, preaching kind of format. But the purpose of this is to help you really get an understanding of God's eternal purpose. See, if you were to ask most Christians, in fact, I want to ask you this question, what is God's ultimate intention? Think about it for a second. What is God's ultimate intention? Do you know what God's ultimate intention is? Do you know why God created the heavens and the earth? Do you know why, do you know what God is working towards and why he created us? Think about it for a second. If you ask most Christians, they would say something like this. God created us to save us. God created us to glorify himself. God created us to make disciples of Jesus and the nations. God created us to bring justice to the earth. And all those are biblical, but that falls very short of God's ultimate intention of why he created us. And see, most Christians just kind of look at you with a deer in the headlight look when you say that. It, you're, you're saying God had a greater purpose, a different purpose than to glorify himself and save us? That's absolutely what I'm saying. That's absolutely what Paul reveals in the book of Ephesians. See, the Bible did not, the story of the Bible did not begin in Genesis chapter 1. It begins in Ephesians chapter 1, when Paul takes us back into the eternal counsel of the Godhead and reveals to us by revelation God's driving purpose for why he created the earth. And we'll get into that in a minute. But the reason why, if you've ever noticed why the church is so shallow so event-driven, so driven by this celebrity kind of culture you see, especially in America, that's just, you know, so shallow, leaving people going, God, there's got to be more, so religious, I'm convinced it's because we don't understand what God is trying to accomplish. We're operating on a blueprint that's not God's blueprint. We think God's ultimate intention is salvation. We think God's ultimate intention for creating us was to patch up the effects of the fall. See, so much of what the church is preoccupied with today is patching up the effects of the fall, bringing justice, bringing, you know, helping the poor, and doing all these different things to bring restoration and redemption. Now, all that's great. Don't get me wrong. All we need, all of that. But none of that would have even been necessary if Adam would have eaten from the tree of life. See, all that the church is consumed with today, all that the church is driven by today is patching up the effects of the fall. Isn't that true? But what would have happened, and what was God after, if Adam would have eaten from the tree of life? No one ever talks about that, but the tree of life was God's ultimate intention. It was leading us to something that God purposed in creation. And so, the great need we have today is that most of the people, this is, this is absolutely true, most of the people who, who talked about God's ultimate intention, God's eternal purpose, are dead. It's the thing that drives everything God does, and 99% of the church doesn't even talk about God's ultimate intention. The people who did are dead. That tells you we've got a problem in the church. Wouldn't you agree? As God is operating based on a blueprint that he crafted in eternity past, and most of the church doesn't even have a clue that God has an eternal purpose. I didn't even, I've heard, I was in the Lord for 20 plus years and didn't have a clue God had an eternal purpose. You know, and I was like, you know, God's eternal purpose. Like, what is that? I don't even know. What is God's eternal purpose? I mean, that shows you where the church is. That's the reason to understand the eternal blueprint. 
Think about the gap we have right now. Everything God does is driven by His eternal purpose. 99, this is not an exaggeration, 99.99% of the church does not even understand what that is. How can God's eternal purpose be fulfilled by people who don't understand what it is? Thus the, the important reason, thus the important ob objective of what God needs in His church is for a people of understanding who know God's eternal purpose. The mystery that Paul revealed in the first century has become a mystery again in his own church. And so if we're going to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled before Jesus Christ comes back, we've got to understand God's eternal purpose. So I'm going to talk now about part one, the blueprint. See, if we really want to understand God's eternal purpose and our purpose in, in Him, we need a God-centered approach. See, so, so much of the church is so self-centered. What can God do for me? How can God bless me? How can God take care of my finances? How can God take care of my sick body? How can God give me favor and give me success? Now, I'm not against any of that. I'm all for God healing my sick body. In fact, I could use a little bit more with this gold. I'm all for God providing the finances we need. I'm all for favor and influence and all of that. But so much of that, if you think about it, is about my inheritance in Christ. What about his inheritance in us? See how self-centered the church is? We love the messages about God's inheritance, our inheritance in Christ. But you start talking about God's inheritance in us, it thins out the crowds. We don't really want to, we're not, we're not so much interested in the God-centered approach. But God is God-centered, by the way. <laughs> He's raising up a people who are God-centered. Everything God does is God-centered. <laughs> He's not a heavenly Santa Claus that exists to bless you, though He does bless us, thankfully. And so we need a God-centered approach. We need the proper starting point. We need a starting point that is an eternity past, before time, before creation, before heaven, before the angels, even before the throne of God. So we don't think like that. We don't think like that. And so a pitfall I've seen, a snare that I've seen in the church is that many Christians, they overemphasize certain passages of Scripture neglecting God's ultimate intention. Now this does not mean we should not talk about these or embrace these. These are very important, but they're not the ultimate intention. For example, end time prophecy. There's a whole movement of people, and everything is about who is the Antichrist, and what is the mark of the beast, and you know, when's this blood moon going to take place, and all this stuff. And don't get me wrong, I am into end time prophecy. I believe very strongly that we should understand the times we live in, but end time prophecy is not God's ultimate intention. You could talk about revival and miracles. There's a whole, man, you need to get into the charismatic movement, which we are a part of. The whole emphasis is upon miracles and healing and signs and wonders and revival. And to even talk like I'm talking almost sounds like heresy. You're saying that's not God's ultimate intention. I'm absolutely saying God's ultimate intention is not revival, signs and wonders and miracles. We've had revival, signs, wonders, and miracles throughout history, and has that really got us to the place of seeing God's ultimate intention fulfilled? No. There's something deeper God's after. Now, I'm absolutely, totally, 100% behind revival, signs, wonders, and miracles. I just know that God is never going to get what He wants if that's all that happens. Social justice. I mean, that's a big thing rising up in the church today is we want to, we want to, this is all, again, this is really good stuff. We want to take care of people's needs. We want to bring water to those who don't have water. We want to help relieve poverty. We want to take care of those who are in desperate situations. We want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Hey, that is beautiful. That is wonderful. That is great. But that's not God's ultimate intention. The reason you even have to bring social justice to the nations is because of the fall. God wants and is looking for something deeper. God had something greater in mind. The restoration of Israel. I 
completely believe in the restoration of Israel. I see the prophets and I read it and I just see God is moving to restore Israel. You know, you, you read the prophets and you see the, the incredible times that are coming in the prophetic scriptures, but some people just get locked up that God's ultimate intention is to make Israel a praise in the earth. I'm telling you, there's something much deeper than, than making Israel the praise of the earth. A big one that that's, we're seeing, or bigger, that we're seeing is we got to go back to the Jewish roots of Christianity. We think, okay, if we go back to the Jewish roots of Christianity, then we'll have God's ultimate intention. And they want to go back to Moses and the Torah and all that was revealed in the Torah. And they think this is what God is really after. There's something far deeper than, than what God revealed to Moses in the Torah. Now, in, in, my, in my book, The Eternal Blueprint, I go into a lot more detail about all of this. Another big one, especially in America, is the blessings of Abraham. God exists to bless me. You know, we, we, you know, we are, God is a God of prosperity. God is a God of miracles. God is a God of healing. I believe all of that. I believe God does want to bless you. God does want to prosper you. God does want to heal your body. God does want to give you success and influence. I just know that's not the ultimate intention that is driving the Godhead. God did not create us so that he could, from heaven, be a heavenly Santa Claus that wants to bless us with healing and finances and all that. And that, that, now there's a whole movement you know, wrapped up in many different ways, but basically is this, God exists to bless you. God exists to provide for you. God exists to heal you. Now, He does, and He will, but there's something deeper. Advance the kingdom is another one where, you know, God's main thing is to advance the kingdom and see the kingdom of God influence the culture and see the nations impacted and all those different things. But we got to go back further if we want God's ultimate intention. And finally, the biggest one is salvation. To even say that God has something bigger than salvation, that God has something greater than salvation, I mean, that sounds like heresy. You're telling me that God has something more than saving us and bringing us to heaven? I mean, that sounds like I'm a heretic or a false teacher. But if you read the scriptures, salvation was only necessary because of the fall. God did not preordain the fall. God did not pre-purpose the fall. There's something deeper than that. So here's the point. If we really want to understand God's ultimate intention, if we really want to see, okay, what is driving the Godhead? We've got to go back to eternity past. We have to go back to when it was God and God alone. I mean, have you ever really sat and thought about that for a minute? What it was like when it was God and God alone. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in unapproachable light. I mean, just get the picture here for a second. The, the Godhead dwelling in unapproachable light. I mean, there was nothing created even at the time, but if there was, nothing could even come close to the Godhead. Because of the intensity of the unapproachable light, even in Revelation when we see the, their, the face of God unveiled, it says, heaven and earth fled away from him in terror. And we're talking about the unapproachable light of Almighty God. But if you read the scriptures, you find that there was the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in this perfect union of intimacy, delight, and fellowship. If you read even further, you get the understanding that God the Father had a, has always had a burning passion for His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, He wasn't Jesus back then. He was the Son. He didn't get His name Jesus until He was incarnated. That's a whole other story. The Eternal Blueprint will explain that in more detail. That blows your mind. When I started teaching this, some people were like, I never thought about Jesus before He was Jesus. Well, he was the eternal son before he became Jesus. Dwelling in the, 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 the heart of God, dwelling in the father heart of God. The father, just un, 
leashing his infinite love upon the Son. I, I mean, I can't even imagine it. I mean, the euphoria, the, the pleasure, the delight that God the Father has for His Son, even in eternity past, and the Son turning it back to the Father in love. I mean, I can't even fathom what that was like, the intimacy, the bond, the union, the communion between God the Father and God the Son by the Spirit of God. I mean, that to us, that sounds like, that sounds like that would kind of get boring. There's no video games, there's no football, there's, you know, there's no food. I mean, there's the things we dri drive us today, shopping, whatever, uh, renovating your kitchen, whatever it is. Um, that stuff that drives us today, there was none of that, but yet God was never even closely bored. I mean, we can't even fathom that. But here's the point, and this is what is so important. It's the Father's love for His Son. This is, the, this, is what, this, is what, this is why you exist. This is why there is a universe and an earth. It was the Father's love for His Son that was the catalyst for God's eternal purpose. Without that, we would not exist. God the Father, His passion for His beloved Son is the catalyst for His eternal purpose. Everything that God has done flows out of the passion the Father has for His Son. Out of this deep abiding eternal love relationship that the Godhead determined to create mankind, here's, here's what I'm getting at. He wanted to invite us into His purpose of the ages. The very, here, here's, here's, we'll get into this in more detail, but the very driving purpose of the Godhead was to bring a creation into the very fellowship that God the Father, God the Son, shared by God the Spirit in eternity past. You were created for relationship with the Godhead. This whole thing is about relationship. It's not about religion. It's not about doing good and being good. It's about having the life of Christ in us and coming into the relationship, the very relationship that God the Father and God the Son shared by God the Spirit in eternity past, we have been invited into that very fellowship with the Godhead. That is incredible. What incredible, that is the goodness of God. You know, we want to define the goodness of God by how God blesses us and how God takes care of us. I'm telling you, the goodness of God is much greater than that. The goodness of God is that God Himself, in total bliss and pleasure and satisfaction, would allow us and create us to bring us into what the Godhead has forever enjoyed, and that is God Himself. Gosh, it's good. That's the good news of the gospel, by the way. <laughs> is that we are called into eternal fellowship and relationship with the Father. Yes. So let's now turn to, let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, like I mentioned a, a second ago, the Bible did not start with Genesis chapter 1. It started in Ephesians chapter 1. It started with Paul unveiling to us by revelation this plan that God purposed that in love He predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. Before the foundation of the world He predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. See, some people get this idea, okay, well, this is, what this, this is what this verse means. Before the foundation of the world, God predestined who would be saved and who would go to hell. God predestined this person would be saved, this person would be damned. This person would go to heaven, this person would go to hell. That's, that's what a lot of people have interpreted predestined to mean. That paints a terrible picture of God. I'm sorry. That is an awful picture that God wouldn't even give you a choice to be saved. 
Uh, that's not what that means. If you dig into the Greek, and I've got all this in, in the Eternal Blueprint book, basically this word, predestined, is the word prarizo, which without going into all the details, the book goes into the, the details, that word means, is a, an equivalent word for that is a blueprint. That God determined a plan. God determined a plan before the foundation of the world. He did, it was not about who would be saved and who would go to hell. It was not about who would be damned and who would live forever in His presence. It was about the, the plan of God was predetermined before creation. And again, I've got that in the book to go into more detail. So now, when we look at the word predestined in the New Testament, rather than thinking about who's, who is in and who's out, rather than thinking God predestined that one but not that one, think instead of the plan that God established in the Godhead. The plan, the eternal plan God established in the Godhead. The blueprint that drives every single thing God does. See, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, one of his main objectives was to explain that God's eternal purpose, and this is why he wrote the book of Ephesians in my opinion, is God's eternal purpose established in the heavenly council of the Godhead in eternity past is the blueprint that drives everything God has done or will ever do. That's in my opinion why he wrote the book of Ephesians. Well, How did Paul know that God had a predetermined plan. How did God know about this blueprint? Well, the answer, I believe, is in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 7, Paul was called up to the third heaven. Because you just can't just come up with this. I mean, no one was even around. There weren't even angels back then when the God had established their predetermined plan. There was nothing created except God and God alone that had to come to Paul by revelation. My, my opinion is that when Paul was called up to heaven, and as he describes in 2 Corinthians 12, it was at that time that Paul was shown this is what happened before the foundation of the world. And so Paul wrote this book, the book of Ephesians. He wrote it to unveil God's eternal purpose. Now let's, let's turn to a couple scriptures here. Ephesians 1, verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of His will, this eternal purpose, according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him. Now we'll read down in verse 11. He says that we have been predestined according to His purpose. Now notice the, the connection between the plan of God foreordained, the plan of God predetermined, and His purpose. We have been, the, the plan of God was predestined, was planned before the foundation of the world according to the purpose of God. The purpose of God is what established it, who works all things. Now that's, that's we just kind of glance over that, but that is a massive statement right there. Think about that. Now God does some things that are not part of His eternal plan. He does that. But everything, everything God does, in fact in, in Romans 8.28 it says, God works all things for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Where it's not just any random purpose that He's talking about you're called to. It's about God's eternal purpose. God, this is what, the, this is what Paul is unveiling to us. Everything God does. Everything God does. Everything God does is directing us back to His ultimate intention. Everything. That's what He's saying right here. He works all things after the counsel of His will. And so if you look in the Greek, this word counsel is the word boule, and it basically means, it basically means a council where gr a group of people got together and they gave their advice and their counsel for establishing and determining something. You can see about it in Jeremiah 23, 18 through 22, that the Lord has a counsel that He establishes plans by. And so, 
Basically, what's happening before the foundation of the world, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before one act of creation, this, I don't even know how it worked. I mean, it's far beyond my ability to understand it. But however that is, they communicated, they communicated their eternal plan in this heavenly council that would be everything that would drive what they do. And so everything God does is driven by this blueprint. So now the question we have is what exactly is God's ultimate intention? Well, where do we find it in Scripture? You know, when, and, and what I've found is that as I've studied God's ultimate intention, what I've found is you can't find just one place in Scripture that articulates everything about God's ultimate intention. It's more like a putting together a puzzle. It's more like, okay, you, you, we've all done the jigsaw puzzles and we got them all, a 500 piece puzzle laid out on the coffee table and we're trying to say, okay, what is, goes here and what goes here? I mean, just imagine you didn't have the box to understand, okay, this is what the final picture looks like. You would have to carefully examine each piece of the puzzle and look at the colors and look at the way it was shaped. And then you would say, okay, this fits to here and that fits to here. And then finally, when you got everything assembled together, you could see, oh, this is the, the picture God is driving for. That, that's the way God's ultimate intention is in Scripture, in my opinion, is there's not one place in Scripture that says, this is it, this is it, this is it. it, it really, it's like putting together a piece of the, it's like putting together a puzzle. And so, if you were to take out, if you were to take out everything in Scripture that talks about the fall, the covenants, the finished work of the cross, justification, forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption, all of those things that happened because Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you could arrive at this is God's ultimate intention. And so what I found in my study is that if you read, the, to me, God's ultimate intention is revealed most clearly in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, from John chapter 17. In fact, I would encourage you, before you even read the book, The Eternal Blueprint, read these scripture verses. That's far more important than anything I would have said. Read the books of Ephesians, read Colossians, Hebrews, Philippians 3 especially, Romans chapter 8, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Revelation 21 and 22. Those to me, in my opinion, those, those portions of Scripture, when you put all of those portions of Scripture together, you get the picture of God's eternal blueprint. You get what God's eternal purpose is. So I would encourage you, definitely, definitely read those scriptures. So let's talk real quick about five, okay, five components of God's eternal blueprint. Number one is the sun will be at the center of everything in heaven and on earth. I mean, if, if I, like what I said earlier, the catalyst of God's ultimate intention was God the Father's love and passion for His Son then I assure you, in the universe, God the Father is jealous to make His Son have the preeminence in everything. In fact, that's what Paul said in Colossians, that, that the Son of God would have the preeminence in everything. So everything God's doing and all that God is working towards is so that Jesus Christ would have the exaltation of the supremacy and the, the preeminence in everything. Everything in heaven and on earth is working to be summed up under the headship of Jesus Christ. I mean, you, you look around, and you, okay, what is God doing? I'm telling you, one thing God's doing is the first component of this blueprint. He is working so that His name, the name of Jesus Christ, would be the only name above every name. In fact, if Zechariah talks about that, that in his name, when he returns, then in that day his name will be the only name. Right now in the church we have so many names. We have so many celebrity worship leaders and celebrity preachers and celebrity this and that and all that stuff. I'm telling you, God is working at the end of the age based on His eternal plan and purpose to make the Son of God the head of His church once again. And there's jealousy in that. 
There's the jealousy of God that he would come back to his church. In fact, I believe one of the reasons God is bringing judgment to the house of God is because he is cleansing it of all the self-centeredness and all the self-exaltation so that Christ would be exalted in his house once again. So that he would have the preeminence. The entire universe, everything in heaven and on earth is being gathered under his headship. Everything. Anything that will not submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ absolutely and completely is subject to God's wrath and God's judgment. And that is kindled by the deep love and jealousy God the Father has for His Son. The second component is the Father will have a family of Christ-like sons. This whole thing is about family. God's eternal purpose is about family. Your family is a picture of God's family. Well, let me say, it's meant to be a picture of God's family. <laughs> Got to clarify that, because some of you are like, dear God, if that's what he has in mind, I don't want any part of it. <laughs> Got to clarify that. <laughs> God's intention for your family is what he was aiming for. <laughs> This thing is about a healthy family. God the Father, His passion for His Son, moved Him to say, I want, the dream of my heart is to have a million, a billion sons just like my son. That's your calling. Your calling is more than being in ministry. Your calling is more than having a career. Your calling is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ as a son. And that's just not going to be you and, you know, you and the Father. It is, a, it is one massive family that we are brothers and sisters where every dividing wall is being torn down. All the division and disunity is being torn down. God is raising up a corporate man. God is raising up a corporate man, the very body of Jesus Christ, conformed into the image of Jesus Christ together. See, we're going to be together for eternity as brothers and sisters. It's going to be beautiful. That's God's eternal purpose. And so Paul said that he adopted us as sons. And so in the book, The Eternal Blueprint, goes into a lot more detail about this. But there were three phases of Roman adoption that Paul is alluding to here. Phase one is being placed into God's family. And so when we were born again, we became literally the children of God. We have his DNA. We were born of the Spirit. Phase two is we were placed under a child trainer, the Holy Spirit, who is grooming us for sonship. He's grooming us for our inheritance. The trials you're going through, the suffering you've been through, the, the, the chastising God has taken you through is for one purpose, is that he is, he is wanting to make you like his son, to place you into the inheritance with His Son, Jesus Christ. Well. And phase three is the final phase. Is, is when Jesus comes back, Revelation chapter 20, when the entire body of Christ, those who've overcome, are placed into the inheritance with the Son of God at the same time. And then we receive all the promises that Jesus listed in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 as firstborn sons of God. It's a beautiful plan God has. Number three is the son will have an equally yoked bride. See, back in eternity past, the catalyst that drove the father's love, the catalyst that drove the, the father's passion for his son, he said, I want to raise up a people, a creation, that would have the very love that burns in my heart would be placed into a creation of millions, billions of people who would have the life of the Son of God in them, but they would love my Son just like I do. And he called those people the bride. See, before the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, which were a type and a shadow, there was another woman inside of the Son 
Just as Eve was inside of Adam, the church, the ecclesia was inside of Jesus Christ. And when he was incarnated on the cross and the Roman spear pierced his side and blood and water poured forth, then the ecclesia began to come forth. And we see it fully on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God descends and the Holy Spirit fills a new creation who becomes the betrothed bride of Jesus Christ. The very eternal plan to give the Son an equally yoked bride whom He would pour out His love upon like the Father poured out His love upon Him and love Him back in return with the same love that they have been loved as one corporate people. This is the driving passion of the Godhead is to bring the Son a bride who is worthy of Him. That's why you exist. And yet the church is woefully, woefully unprepared for what God wants. The Lord spoke to me in a dream and said, my leadership is lusting after my bride. See, God has got to bring change into the church. God's got to raise up friends of the bridegroom whose main mission and purpose is to see the bride made ready in the nations. Number four is the Holy Spirit will have a temple, a house, and a body that he fully possesses and fills. The Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints, the ecclesia, was conceived in the eternal counsel of the Godhead. See, in the eternal counsel of the Godhead, the Father said to the Son, you are the life that will be planted into the hearts of my people. You are the life. You are Christ in you, the hope of glory. The divine life of Jesus Christ, the divine life of the Son, would be planted within a creation. Wow. I mean, the angels have to look at us and go, they don't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, you're getting caught up in the Alabama LSU game. You don't even realize you've got Christ in you. I'm not saying it was bad to watch that, but, but I'm saying we settle for something so much less than what God wants. I was just kidding about that, but you know, God's, the angels are like, you have the son's life in you. And you live as if you don't. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit's inheritance is to raise up a people who would have the life of Christ in fullness, the very body of Jesus Christ, the church. The Holy Spirit's inheritance to bring a people that would be fully possessed by God himself. And then point number five is that believers have been invited into eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory. That's summarizing the promises to the overcomers in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. What a glorious plan God has. I mean, the invitation to us is you are called in the very fellowship that God the Father and God the Son shared it in eternity past. That very fellowship, you're called to come into that, to dine with Jesus for all eternity. And you can read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 to see that. If, if that weren't enough, God's ultimate intention is to give us eternal authority. You were destined for the throne. God wants to give you a rod of iron by which you will rule the nations. God wants us to rule and reign with the Son of God for all eternity. That is incredible. Think about that. Kingdom authority exercised through you. And then finally, God's ultimate intention is to give us eternal glory. 
eternal glory where we would shine like the sun in his strength, where we would be in the heavenly holy of holies for all eternity. Revelation 22 and 5. The bond servants of God see his face in the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever, worshiping right before his throne in unbreathtaking beauty. What, I mean, what an incredible plan. What an incredible plan God has for us. That is, in a nutshell, I know there's a lot more we'll go into in the next few weeks. The plan God has for us is absolutely amazing. Amen. Amen. Amen.